Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with me, your girl, Stephanie Hardy. Um, If you're celebrating this weekend, you know, that's great and everything. (laughs) Um, I'm so happy to be able to bring this episode to you. Of course, I got your news and gossip-ish for what's going on in wrestling this week. It was a pretty, you know, chill week in wrestling news and gossip-ish, but still all the more interesting to hear about. And then we have an interview with Blurred um, podcast creator Jared Hicks, who's also a good friend of mine here in Birmingham. And I'll have your regular wrestling weekly update for all the shows with Raw Smackdown and NXT. So sit back, relax, and listen to this new episode of Hardy Wrestling with me, Stephanie Hardy. Okay, so now we're going to start with our news and gossip-ish. So first on the docket is the fact that WWE has reportedly purchased Evolve Wrestling. Now, according to the ProWrestlingInsider.com, WWE will have the complete right to use the Evolve brand name and produce Evolve events going forward, whether as live events or WWE Network programming. Now, the Evolve promotion was more so of a smaller um, promotion that was kind of like an offset somewhere, and that was started in 2010, and it ran 146 events through this March, serving as a pipeline to WWE for wrestlers like Tony Nese, Apollo Crews, Austin Theory, who you see on Raw almost all the time, Matt Riddle, who's on SmackDown now, Ricochet, and Shotzi Blackheart from NXT. Basically, a lot of these wrestlers who are on NXT and also on 205 Live, um, they had this pipeline sort of into NXT and to the Performance Center through Evolve Wrestling. Now, since the crisis has happened, they haven't really had to they haven't been able to have any monthly or bi-monthly live events. So almost it was almost as if, if WWE didn't provide any talent for them to have any of their independent shows, the promotion probably would have gone under years ago. So for them to, you know, own it already would basically, I guess, it was almost like a connection already. So it was kind of simple for them to sort of go forth with the purchasing process. So I hope that it could can evolve, can continue to flourish under the WWE umbrella like it has. So there's that. Also in the news, we have Vince McMahon who might possibly want the UK wrestler Walter for the main roster. Now, this is a guy, um, this came from a guy named Dave Meltzer, who's probably like the one person everybody kind of goes to for their insider news in WWE. They consider him like the wizard of all of it. And he basically said on Wrestling Observer Radio that WWE might want United Kingdom champion um, Walter on the main roster. But since he's well, not real, since he lives in the UK, he might not want to move to the United States. And that it's impossible to imagine a main roster run for any superstar who does not live in the United States, especially at this time. Now, if you've seen Walter before, he's known as the Ring General, and he has his group called Imperium. Here lately on NXT, Imperium are like the, they're the NXT Tag Team Champions. And it's made up of Marcel Bartel and Fabian Eichner and Walter and a fourth guy whose name I can't recall right now. But basically... They're like this faction and they kind of put you in the mind of the Four Horsemen or um, Evolution or even the Undisputed Era in more current in a more current time. And they're very dominant in how they wrestle. Of course, they have a more strong style form of wrestling that's a little bit rougher and tougher um, than American style of wrestling. But Walter has basically remained the NXT UK champion for like a while now. And it seemed like for a minute he was being challenged by Finn Balor, but we don't really know what came of that. And of course, now since all of the allegations came out with the speaking out um, hashtag, the future of the NXT UK is sort of up in the air right now. But honestly, I guess if Walter really didn't feel some type of way about traveling back and forth since we're in the midst of a crisis right now, um he will probably join the main roster but who's who knows what can actually happen in the crazy world of wwe so we'll be on the lookout for that 
Also in the news, we have um, a rumor about the location of SummerSlam. Um, as you may or may not know, probably the second or third biggest pay-per-view of the year is SummerSlam. It's like you have WrestleMania, which is the top one, and then you have maybe the Royal Rumble um, as its second top one because that leads to WrestleMania and everything that's meant to happen with that. And then you have SummerSlam, which is basically like the summer's WrestleMania, and then you have um, Survivor Series, which is basically, you know, towards the end of the year. And those are known as the big four pay-per-views in WWE canon. Now, WrestleVotes um, reported that WWE isn't sure how to hold this year's SummerSlam event on August 23rd with fans in attendance. Because here lately, since the crisis has happened, they've been trying to rework their pay-per-views to make it more interesting for television like having theatrical matches and then having of course their regular wrestling matches in the performance center now they have not yet made a decision apparently about where they're gonna have SummerSlam and they may not necessarily want to do it in a performance center but with everything that's been going on here lately i'm pretty sure they wouldn't necessarily have that much of a choice but that's not to say that the pay-per-view won't be good either because i mean as you can see wwe and other promotions have been taking lemons and creating lemonade and probably some of the best creative work that they've ever had you know from this pandemic so i'm pretty sure that for SummerSlam they'll be able to turn it around and still make it just as good you know as if it would be you know in a place like the barclays center or like madison square garden or just anywhere that's an actual arena so we'll see we'll see but i feel like it'll be good i'm hopeful um <laughs> also on the list for gossip we have tessa blanchard and who she's expected to land with um alex mccarthy of talksport has reported that wwe is definitely a front runner to land tessa blanchard now as you know she or you may not know i did talk about it last week um she was the impact wrestling world champion and the first female to ever do so but she was let go from impact after failing to make the most recent television tapings and then refusing to film promos requested to build up their slam aversary pay-per-view on july 19th which is very important like if you're not if you're the champion and if you're not participating in this stuff then what's the point of you even being there so The report also stated that All Elite Wrestling um, has no interest in Tessa Blanchard at this point. But what's so funny is the show actually, AEW actually has Tully Blanchard, who was her famous father and one of the original Four Horsemen, you know, as a manager for Sean Spears, who used to be Ty Dillinger in WWE. But I can say this, if Tessa were to go to WWE, the amount of I, if you're looking at the positives the amount of press that would bring to them would be good and then if you think about the amount of rich talent that they have in their women's division and Tessa Blanchard's ability it would just be amazing can you imagine a daughters of the four horse horsemen match between Charlotte Flair and Tessa Blanchard, that is straight money. Like, I don't care what anybody says. Or even a match with Tessa Blanchard versus Sasha Banks at this point, who is absolutely in her prime. Like, that would be incredible. Like, <laughs> like that would be amazing. But then also on the negative, you have to understand that I had also discussed Tessa Blanchard's, you know, past with not being able to play well with others and also her possible disrespect of people of women of color um, in the indie scene as well. So would WWE be able to handle that, you know, backlash amongst people and amongst fans who would feel like they may have betrayed their fan base of color? So who knows what could happen with that? So also in the news we have drew mcintyre who was ripping conor mcgregor so conor mcgregor has retired from mixed martial arts um if you may or may not know and drew mcintyre might be doing his part to sort of get the former ufc champion to the squared circle now in an instagram story conor mcgregor basically um was messing around and said that if he was in a match 
like what would happen if he was in a match with Vince McMahon. But Drew McIntyre responded and said that he would have no chance up against Vince. He was quoted on Twitter by saying, big man picking a fight with another 70 year old. You couldn't drop a guy in a pub. You have no chance against Vince. You're just the latest guy thinking he can have his PR team stick my title on his shoulder and walk into our world. Stick to whiskey, McTapper. Pretty mean stuff um so what's so funny about this is with conor mcgregor's attitude and his like he likes to be the big guy on campus as you can see like he likes to just walk around and pretend that he's all that and all of that and he like and when he was at you know doing his mma stuff he would walk out and pretend to walk out like vince mcmahon like he's a big fan he's always played with the idea of being in the wwe because his charisma would fit and his grappling ability would be amazing imagine a match between him and matt riddle woo so <laughs> or even a match between him and brock lesnar with his mma background that would be really Really cool so he also tweeted that he didn't mean con mcgregor tweeted and said he didn't mean to disrespect wwe fans and he said what i meant to say was that i'd slap the head off your entire roster and twice on sundays so we'll see what happens with that um i would be open to seeing con mcgregor in the wwe i just hope that he wouldn't necessarily act like he's all that all the time so that's all that's going on in the wrestling world in terms of news and gossip ish and now we're gonna go to my interview with the awesome Jarrett hicks okay so one of the best parts about having this podcast is being able to share stories from my own experiences, but also being able to share the experiences of other people around me who love wrestling, who who are professionals in the business, of course, um, and people who are just like me, who are just fans, who just enjoy watching everything happen as is, and who also have other things going on to sort of open the doors for fans to be their full um authentic selves within their fandoms not even just in wrestling but also with other things that they might enjoy like comic books and all and art and all of the above so with this interview um for this week i was happy and fortunate to be able to speak to jared hicks who immediately you know express interest in being on the podcast when I first announced I was going to do it. And he's um, a great friend. Um, I met him through my boyfriend and he was just the sweetest person on the planet. He is a podcaster. He has his own podcast called Blurred Over with Micah Blair, who is also an amazing um, fan slash black nerd that I met at Comic-Con last year, but I met Ric Flair. And they are just really good people in Birmingham who are giving um, Birmingham people like me, like millennials or whatever, and also people who are older as well, and um, opportunity to share their nerdy interests and an opportunity to just be able to do things in certain events. Um, so sit back, relax, and enjoy this interview I had with Jared Hicks. Hello? Here we go. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> oh, all right. I'm glad to have you back on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, Jared Hicks, I'm so glad you were able to come on my show and um, do this interview because, like I said earlier, we've been trying to get it together for the longest time. So here we are. All right. We're here. All right. So I'm going to ask you, when did you fall in love with wrestling? I fell in love with wrestling at around the right age of six or seven. It was sometime in the period. Um, my brother, he's 11 years older than me. He t he asked me, he said, hey, do you want to see a man fly? And so I'm like, sure, I want to see a man fly. Nobody can fly. And so we, we started watching, we started watching Raw and um, I saw Shawn Michaels for the first time kip up and get on top, on the top rope and, and do that flying elbow and I was hooked since that point. Okay. Well, 
I can say that my story was kind of the same way, except it wasn't really a sibling that brought me into it. It was my dad who brought me into it. So, except he didn't really introduce me into it. He was just watching it, and then I just sort of walked in the room and just started watching it with him. Just because, like, what's was that? There. Yeah, it was like, just because dad was there, and I was just like, okay, well, let's watch this. <laughs> right. Dad thinks it's cool, so it's got to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Was there ever a point in your life in which you lost interest in wrestling? And if so, what brought you back to it? I started losing. Well, I wouldn't say necessarily completely lost interest. I got to a point where we didn't have cable. Then they moved SmackDown to cable. That really hurt me. And so it was around that high school time for me. And so um, at that point, I kind of I kind of fell out of it. Then I even tried to convince myself, I don't like this stuff, man. This is for little kids. You know what I'm saying? So, uh. <laughs> but then as I got older, once I think what really brought me back was CM Punk. And when I saw the thing, the things that he was doing and saying, it felt so fresh to me because it felt like, okay, you know, they're coming, they're coming back. They're coming back with like realness of it because mm -hmm. that's what that's what really drew a lot of us into it growing up was the realness and the rawness of those promos. They weren't scripted or anything like they are now. So um, getting back, so seeing that definitely brought me back. And then recently, I mean, I ain't, I ain't even gonna sit here and stunt with you. Like I ain't peeking around the corner. I don't know why <laughs> as often as I used to. But I definitely always keep up with everything that's going on. Okay. I think it's funny that you mentioned how CM Punk sort of brought you back into it. Because I think here lately I have been watching a lot of stuff that he was doing around the 2010s. Um, 2010, 2011, 2012 era. Where there was a point where he sort of redefined wrestling for what we thought it was. And it's just, it's so funny because that's Najakwa's favorite wrestler and or at least around that time that was his favorite wrestler oh, because he loved he loved his honesty and just how he was able to you know to just say you know what he actually felt in a True. way that you know kind of just cut right. <laughs> right. And, and it was just you know I felt like in my mind that CM Punk was very rare for his time and I feel like a lot of the time between him and AJ Lee you know who he's married to now um they were kind of the right wrestlers, but just in the wrong time frame. Because I feel like they would fit better in WWE now more so than back then. Because I don't think they were sure. truly ready for them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, I, I, I definitely can see that. I mean, because this was like really radical for the time. Like, you know, with the whole Super Cena deal. And, you know, it was almost like in that era, it was almost like they, that Vince was kind of trying to bring back like that classic era with the superhero kind of mentality of everything. But then CM Punk came in and said, you know what? I'm like 6'2", bruh. I'm like 220 pounds, but I got a mouth on me and I'm going to say what I want to say. And you, couldn't, and you couldn't do nothing but appreciate that honesty and the rarity of that character. And he's one of the only characters really who gets to go out there and they're just like, hey, here's a couple points. Hit these points. And he's like, cool, I got it. And that was the coolest thing about it. Like, I, I remember one where he, him and... uh. They were him and uh, Paul Heyman. They were on a football field and they were just like walking. And I just remember just like how relaxed and how smooth it was. Like it didn't feel like that he. It didn't feel like he was trying to impress anybody or anything like that. He was just being himself, and people appreciate that. Yeah, it was great. You know, for the time, and I just, I just really wish. You know, there. I feel like there was so there could have been so much more that he could have done. But he's happy where he is. So, I mean, I don't necessarily want to be one of those fans to just try to push it and make it seem like, oh, he should come back. Like, I don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, he was really great. And he just seemed like he was really relaxed with what he was doing. So, I appreciate you actually saying that and actually bringing that up. Because I was also, you also mentioned how you sort of peek around the corner at rest and you really don't watch it, you know, on the regular. Um so when you do get a chance to look at it, you know, what are some things that you find interesting about it? I know one thing that I saw that I thought I would never see. 
in wrestling. Um, because I, because I remember like waking up one, waking up one day and seeing Big E and Kofi Kingston in the ring on a knee holding up Black Power, and I was like, <laughs> they let them do that? Shut your mouth! So I had to go. I had to go and look at that. Um, it definitely was a for real. Um, a surreal feeling. I really love the fact that they're pushing Drew McIntyre. Um, I I really do love that guy finally gets his chance in the sun. Um, and man, with all this AEW stuff, I mean, it's it, they're really starting to grow on me because at first, seeing with me growing up on that 90s WWE, I really enjoyed that entertainment aspect of wrestling. And without the crowd, a lot of that is gone. And also in the back of my mind, it's like, are these guys really getting over or are they not? You know what I'm saying? We don't know. And so, um, but really started to grow on the, you know, the Darby Allens and all of those people of the world too. Um, I think the AEW's really caught its wind. I think they've really found their niche. And I mean, it's cool. Okay. Well, um, I want to ask you as a fan, what are some positive, what are some other positive aspects of wrestling do you like and what do you believe um, wrestling should improve on at this point? Hmm. I think because what I'm, what I'm noticing right now is there seems to be a whole lot more of listening to fans and what they're saying now because they don't have the pressure of trying to sell tickets and make trying to please the casual fans as much right they're Mm -hmm. not really as worried about it i think they need to do a lot more of that all of the time because what really bothers me is when guys are like on that peak of getting over that mountain and then it's like nah man go on back down and it's been happening Mm -hmm. It's been happening since I've been since I've gotten back into wrestling. I know they did it to Ryback. Um, they tried to do it to Daniel Bryan, but he's so great at what he does to the point where you just couldn't ignore him. But mm-hmm. I mean, even on a smaller degree to like tag teams like the Revival, you know, and stuff like that. It's gotten to the point now, and especially with the NXT stars, you know, it makes me feel like when they come up, are they gonna treat them right? Like this guy was amazing here. And now you're now you're kind of just kind of throw them all in the mid card or throw them in, throw them like in garbage matches and I'm like no, I really feel like that they should be, like you know in that ruthless aggression era in the early 2000s where they were gener- where they were creating new stars. Mm-hmm. I really think that they need to give a lot of these guys more creative freedom than what they're giving them. I think that would I think that would definitely help because that giving creative freedom is how we got the doctor of thugonomics. That's how we got uh, that's how we got Randy Orton's and Batistas of the world because they because they just kind of let guys go and they and they weren't afraid to give somebody a chance. <laughs> you know, and they've got that whole thing of, oh, he's not ready. When Randy first got his first title run, he definitely wasn't ready, was he? But it gave him that chance and that opportunity to be in that spot. So the next time when he got it again, it felt more organic and it felt like he really grew. So that's what I really think they should do is just take more chances on the newer talent. I think it's wonderful that you said that because in my mind, you know, there, I, particularly with the women, um, here lately, since WrestleMania happened, it's like they debuted Bianca Belair. And she is one of my favorite wrestlers, you know, just as a total package. I love her, you know, everything that she has to offer. And I've talked about it so much on this show. Um, (laughs) But it's just like, I feel like she debuted and then she did maybe a couple matches on Raw. And then after that, you didn't see her anymore. And the same thing should could be also said for Shayna Baszler. Like she, sure, oh my god, you know, in her match with Becky Lynch, and then she lost her WrestleMania match for the title, and then she had a little bit of backstage action, and then you wound up not seeing her anymore either. And it's just to a certain, and then you have people like Liv Morgan who's been on TV um, quite a bit, but then it's just like 
it's like they put a whole lot of steam behind them at first, but then they take them away. And I feel like that's kind of hurtful, you know, now since they're basically sort of hurting for new stars, because at this rate, you know, Becky Lynch is gone because she's, of course, you know, having her baby. And then you then you have Charlotte who's left now because she's going she's um taking a break and having really? her, you know, surgery. So it's just kind of like, um, at what point are you going to continue depending on these, you know, of course these, you know, cornerstones who these pillars of the, you know, shows and everything sure. and start, you know, creating these new stars who could very well, you know, carry the torch while these people that you constantly depend on are gone. You know. Right. So I definitely, you know, am hearing what you're saying. I totally agree with that in terms of making new stars and being bolder about that. I appreciate that. Um, I want to ask you, who is your um, favorite wrestler of all time, male and female? My favorite wrestler of all time has got to be the greatest of all time, Shawn Michaels, Mr. WrestleMania. You can't <laughs> give me, you can't, you cannot give me five bad Shawn Michaels matches. You can't. Because even when he loses, he steals the show every single time. And I always love to, because, you know, a lot of people aren't, aren't really, weren't really into wrestling back then and they hate when you go back that far. So I'm like, okay, so let's go back to WrestleMania when he faced John Cena. John Cena wasn't ready for that match. <laughs> Shawn Michaels carried that match and made him look like a superstar. And that's what he did in every single match he's ever had. And he had two of the greatest WrestleMania matches ever with Undertaker. That's not, that's, there's no, there's no denying that. Um, as far as female, as far as female wrestlers. So it's so hard. It's so hard to say. Because the oh, I feel like the older I've gotten, the more I've started to really appreciate that a lot more than I did as growing up. Mm-hmm. And I think the oh, I think the older I get, the more I started really just appreciating people like Trish and things like that. But I really feel like like as far as just like a wrestler's like standpoint, like as a woman, I mean they push her they push her to death. But I I really do love I really do love Charlotte, and that's just because because. Like that, she never really, she never puts on a bad match. She's gonna do what you tell her. She's gonna do go out there and she's gonna have a good match. You already you already know that, and she kind of just oozes that confidence. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like she's she she knows I am it, and you're not gonna stop me. And I love that. And I I I love heels too. I I absolutely love heels. <laughs> so that gives that definitely gives me like yeah. You know, it gives it gives me that uh, that feeling of ha ha. <laughs> you know, that's funny because I tend to you know gravitate more towards faces more than anything. I guess just because I'm just a nice person. <laughs> not to I, say I, that I anybody, it. not to say that anybody you know who loves heels aren't aren't nice people. But I guess I'm just you know a, in my heart, I'm just you know a good conquers evil person. So it's just kind of like I gravitate more towards um, faces in my in my younger life. But, you know, kind of the older I've gotten and the more I've sort of hung around people who, you know, enjoy heels, the more I sort of appreciate heels because, you know, it's an art. Yeah. And then the mindset behind what why they do what they do. It's like I kind of understand it and it makes for a good, you know, back and forth. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Because I, got, I really think it's a lot harder to get people to religiously boo you as opposed to cheer for you. Mm-hmm. Because being because being a faith, in a sense, you just have to be a genuine person. Being a heel is a lot harder because both because at first you have to you have to get people to boo somebody they don't even know. And then when and as time goes on, people start to appreciate heels a whole lot more. And so they end up naturally organically turning. So mm-hmm. I think it's more, I think it has more of an art to it. Because I think you can use somebody like Triple H as an example. He was so good at being a bad guy that you couldn't help but cheer for him. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny because that's my father's favorite wrestler. He loves Triple H. Like, it's almost, it's so funny that it's almost to the point that when my dad is watching NXT, he almost feels like if there's no Triple H, he almost doesn't want it. Like, <laughs> and I'm just like, 
dad. It's not about him. He's being he's being the NXT father now. Like let him <laughs> let him give the give the um opportunity to somebody else now. But he just loves Triple H so much, and it's just so funny. Um, <laughs> and me and him used to fuss about Triple H back and forth all the time. It was it was so funny. He's definitely top five for me for sure. Oh yeah, that's a good one. You know, he's great. Um, and I just, I don't know, I just love seeing him in this, you know, role of, yeah. you know, beefing up the talent now. And I just love seeing him be more, more of like a dad. I don't know. It just, I'm just mushy. Anyway. Yeah. Did you see, like, did you, did you watch that Ruthless, uh, Ruthless Aggression documentary on the, on the network? He, um, when he talked about evolution and finding somebody, you could just hear the excitement in his voice when he started talking about finding Randy and finding Batista and helping Rick get his groove back. And just like, cause that, and it just, it just goes to show you that for a very long time, he's been trying to bring other people up with him. Yeah. That it so. was always in him. Yeah, he was always bringing somebody else with him, and I, I appreciate that about him. Because you probably wouldn't have loved Batista as much as if he didn't, if they didn't go through that whole storyline, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and and it's just, and he just, I mean, I guess because it, it just plays to how good him and, and Trip, him and uh, Sean had such good chemistry too. To the point where he just he was so good at being a heel that he just elevated Sean even more. And it was just it was great. Yeah, okay. So I want to switch gears and sort of ask you about um your podcast Blurred Over with Micah. Um Okay. I had the pleasure of meeting Micah at a at a at Comic Con last year. Um and he and basically he and I were Facebook friends for a long while. And so when he started blurred over i was just like oh this looks very interesting and then when i saw that you were tied to it as well it was just like oh okay well this looks really cool too so i want to ask you um what are some ways in which you've created a safe space for um for black nerds well i think for us we've got a whole lot of stuff that we wanted to do this year i just want to put it out there but it's just because because of COVID and everything, we had to shut a lot of that down. But we always, in almost every podcast, we always want to make sure that we let people know that, hey, this is a safe space where you can come and you can talk about nerdy stuff and it's okay. That's when we love we love being able to do that. And I personally haven't been able to table for Blurred Over yet. Um, but when we do the, we do tables at cons and we give out things and, you know, and not on, not only that, but we feature. If you follow our Instagram, you'll you'll see we feature a lot of black cosplayers. Mm-hmm. Because what you'll find a lot in cosplay is that you'll see a lot of hate for somebody. Like they could say, I don't know, let's say a black girl decides she's she wants to be Sailor Moon. Sailor Moon's not not black, you know. You can't do that. But we try to create a space where it's like, yes, you can. Mm-hmm. yes you can absolutely and we'll always post like hey we're taking new submissions if you're an artist let us know about it if you're a cosplayer let us know about it we'll feature you on our larger platforms so people can see you and when you and if you look down in our comments all of our comments are so positive it's it's, it's amazing to me what this has just organically started to become that's so beautiful to hear. I'm so glad, you know, that you've created this space for um, nerds of color to sort of come and sort of be their, you know, regular selves. Because I've seen some of those comments before, and it was some of those comments that su- that sort of stopped almost, almost it didn't stop me from cosplaying last year as Captain Marvel. But then there was a part well, of that was, was awesome. like, yeah, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> it was just like I was just like, well, maybe you know maybe I should do somebody from Black Panther but then it was just at the time when I went to see Captain Marvel that was the only thing that truly spoke to me on a very personal level and so I was just like I'm gonna do this and when I did it it was like it was so many it was so many positive comments that I got not only just from people I know from but from people I didn't know even at the you know convention and meeting Micah you know and seeing him in his cosplay you know as the character from us was just like whoa 
yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, he was, that's he, his thing. He was really deep into it, and I was just like, I'm really okay. <laughs> and it yeah. makes and it does make you feel good, you know, when you can share your love for a character with other people, and then you can share, you know, what you know about that character to people who might not even know. And it's just a very beautiful thing. Right. Now, but- because it's a Birmingham thing too. Mm-hmm. Like here, you know, there's a there's this thing I like to call it the box, and people in in our black community wants to keep people in this box. You can only like this thing. You right. can only like that thing. I love the I love the fact that I love the fact that we're trying to create a space that says you can still like football and like anime and play video games because a lot of that stuff they would tell you man you can't do that well guess what i'm the embodiment of everything y'all said y'all didn't want i love anime i love sports i love all that stuff and at the same time i probably got more speakers than you could probably count so (laughs) i'm a mixture of all of those things that's why i really got behind it i feel like it's an embodiment of me as a person too Okay, so um, I want to also ask you, how have you made space for wrestling fans of color and are you looking to do more in the future? Yes, we actually, was it episode two or three? We had, um, we had, we had, we had two brothers on and they actually run, uh, their name's escaping me, it was so long ago, the actual name of their group. They actually run um, they actually run a, a wrestling, an independent wrestling uh, company here in Alabama. And we had them on and had them talking about how they manage and stuff like that. And, you know, it was, and now, and we really, we really wanted to say, hey, this is, this is also cool too, because that's one thing we aim to do with podcasts, because we don't always just talk about comics. We've had wrestling fans on, we've had people who even do like sneakers phone so we try to be diverse and include everybody like i said that one of these days i'm gonna get my money right and i'm gonna cosplay as the fiend because i love that outfit and i'm gonna put my i'm gonna put on i love blurred over pen and i'm gonna be out there so definitely for sure okay so back on the subject of wrestling i want to know how you felt about the undertaker's retirement because, as you know, there was this documentary that the WWE Network put out called Undertaker The Last um, Ride. And yeah. it sort of had sort of like the last dance feel from ESPN. Yeah. And it was sort of just charting The Undertaker's last couple of years in the business. And in the very last episode, I don't mean to spoil it, but in the very last episode, he talked about how he felt like he wrestled his last match. So how did you feel about The Undertaker's retirement? Oh man, for for Taker, Undertaker. When I was when I was a little kid, fun fact, I was scared of that dude because around that time, that's when Me the whole Ministry of Darkness <laughs> thing started, and I was like, oh my god, this is terrifying. But as you get, but as I got older, and I really started to understand his craft and his dedication to his craft, even though he's not one of my favorite wrestlers. Of- all time I still have so much respect for him and for the the fact that it just always just seems like Undertaker is like a mainstay right like you're Mm -hmm. always going to see Taker but the fact that he's the fact that he finally decided to hang it up it's like the little kid in me is like don't go but like the adult in me is like I understand man it's time you know and it really just made me just start thinking like man for one I'm getting really old and (laughs) <laughs> too like wow what a career this guy has had you know and like i think if i had to sum it up in one word how i felt about him it would be appreciation like so much so much love so much appreciation for that man you i can't even tell you that's a beautiful way of putting that it is appreciation because he started you know at the beginning of the 90s and now it's just 2020 and now he's you know, called it a career and all I could do was feel, you know, all kinds of love and appreciation because I can remember when um, I would play with my cousins and my cousins would, you know, pretend to be the undertaker and be like, I'm going to take your soul and they'll grab your forehead and, <laughs> you know, and roll their eyes in the back of their hand and, you know, you'll have to fall out and pass out. 
Mama! <laughs> exactly. So it's just kind of like, you know, like when you think about that, it's just sort of like, man, like he was really a mainstay throughout culture. And now it's just, you know, he's wrapping it up, but you know, he wrapped it up his way. And that's the one thing that I can respect. It's like he did it his way and didn't do it when somebody else told him to do it. Oh, it's time for you to go. No, he left when it was his time, when he felt sure. he was ready to go. And I appreciate him for that and everything he's done. And I have one more question. Um, in light of everything that has happened in terms of the speaking out movement involving um, the um, assault, the sexual assault claims yeah. from different wrestlers, um, what ways do you believe that us as wrestling fans and just um, wrestlers in general can just create a safer space for people to just be more of themselves and for men and women to feel free to be themselves without thinking so much about um, be, without being in fear? Right. And I think um, because I was reading a lot of people's comments on this, right? But I think what I think Big E said it very well in the sense of that we try to omit those things. I think we automatically make a safer space by not pushing it to the back burner. You know, like I can I can like tie this into that whole idea of like Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. It's almost like you're taking that whole idea of you know you're you're kind of like forgetting about the act you're not looking at the actual issue you're looking past it and trying to generalize it and i think like with a lot of this that's what we do now i will say this i think in a lot of ways it has gotten a lot better because the respect for women in the industry in itself has organically grown with this whole women's evolution type deal right mm -hmm. but we can't but we also at the same time we can't act like this stuff isn't real we mm -hmm. can't just we can't say things like how they were saying oh she's probably just faking it whatever we have to really we have to take this stuff seriously when a woman says that something is real if something is wrong we really need to try to figure out what something is wrong and i think not turning a blind eye and taking that shade off and really just opening opening your eyes and holding people accountable will go a long way as far as that goes. Yeah, because as you can see, you know, there are some, you know, promotions, including WWE, that are cleaning house, you know, yeah. from people, you know, who were accused. And I guess they they those claims weren't unfounded and they confirmed mm -hmm. it. And they literally just, you know, told them, you know, you don't have a place in this company. And sure. Honestly, and that makes me feel, you know, a whole lot better about the situation that people are really taking these claims seriously now um, to the point to where they're taking action. And though the women have indeed, you know, come such a long way, you still have a couple of people out there and not even just women, because even Keith Lee, um, who's yeah. the NXT North American champion, came out on Instagram and talked about something that he had encountered in terms of being sexually assaulted himself. And it's not just, you know, it's not, it's everyone. It's not just, you know, women. It's also men as well. It's just that I appreciate the fact that they're making those, ch those necessary changes, but I do believe that the women haven't just come this far to only have come this far. It's a lot more than just appreciating, you know, their um, athleticism, but it's, um, it's about appreciating their humanity. Sure. So it's just so I'm just glad that the speaking out movement has, you know, taken place to a degree to where people feel comfortable telling their stories and, you know, giving them safe spaces to say what they're going to say and to protect themselves. And I appreciate everything that you had to say about that just now. Yeah. And then, I mean, too, like you can you can even see it like literally like WWE used to look at women as sex object basically yeah. you know the bra and panty matches and all of that stuff like that's literally objectifying that's almost like that's almost like saying that objectifying this woman is okay right or even and then it even opens the door for things like what would have happened like things that happen to people like Keith Lee to be to just be okay because it it normalizes something and makes it a societal norm and it just makes it okay in that environment and it's not 
and I'm glad that now, like I said, they've they've really hunkered down on that whole ordeal because because at the end of the day, wrestling is a job, and you should not be afraid to come to your job. Period. Right. So I have one more question for you. Sure. Who do you think are the future? Who do you think is the future of the wrestling business? The future. That's a good one. Um, I really, as far as like WWE goes, um, I really, I really love Adam Cole. I think Adam, I think Adam Cole is that guy. I think he's, I think he real, I think he really has a grasp of how to work a crowd. He's a great wrestler. He can make you hate him. He can make you love him. I think he's, I think he's really good at doing that. I also think, um, even though Keith Lee is older, I think Keith Lee, when he comes up to the main roster, I really think he's going to give us some really good memories before he's gone. Um, and I mean, um, as far as, and as far as just like in a, like a grand, like on a grander scale, I really like Hangman Page, man. I love that dude. Like he reminds me, he reminds me so much of like, Stone Cold drinking the beers and stuff, you know, like in that cool factor. I just, I just really love it, and and I and I really, I really like Darby Allen too. Um, I think, but and there's so many other people. I mean, like from from a female perspective, I I really love also too. Like you said, I love Bianca Belair. I think Bianca Belair has it. I really truly do. Um, I I I think that Kyrie Sane is amazing. I've I've never seen. I think out of all of the elbows I've seen, she's up there. Uh, she's definitely up there. And you don't even. And the crazy thing about it is, you don't even have to understand what she's saying to to understand her emotion that she's putting into the ring. Her and Oscar, and I think that's great too. Yeah, I'm really excited about them and what they have to offer in terms of where wrestling can go next. Um, definitely with WWE and definitely in AEW as well. Well, Jared Hicks, thank you so much for coming on my show. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Yes, ma'am. All right. So, so if you want to tell, um, everyone on the show where they can, you know, follow you and, you know, follow Blurred Over and anything else you want to push, please go ahead. Sure, sure. So if you guys do want to follow Blurred Over, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as Blurred Over. That's B L E R D Over. You can also follow me on Instagram. I'm not spoiling it yet, but I've got something coming for you guys. My Instagram handle is It's Teasy Baby. That's I T Z underscore T E E Z Y underscore Baby. I got something coming for y'all in the next week. So just stay tuned. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast, sir. I appreciate it. All right. Okay, so now we're going to go into this week in wrestling. We're going to talk about the events of Raw, SmackDown, and NXT. But we're going to start with Raw. So how about they had a contract signing for Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler for their championship match at Extreme Rules. And they also had a, another contract signing um, going on at the same time between Asuka and Sasha Banks for their Raw Women's Championship match for Extreme Rules as well. And it started off with them fighting. Now, y'all know like contract signings don't usually go well in WWE because all they do is fight <laughs> you know after they've signed the contracts and after they've sort of you know gone back and forth with each other but this night started with them fighting each other and it was incredible like Sasha was fighting out of her shoes Bailey was pulling Sasha off of Asuka Asuka was trying to take advantage of Sasha like Drew and Dolph had started fighting and it was just, it was just a lot now 
it was great, <laughs> you know, and it was just kind of funny because Sasha was just telling Oscar, you know, how she's the blueprint, how she's the standard and how basically her and Bailey were going to take over Ron and take over the women's division of WWE as a whole. Because as you know, Bailey holds the SmackDown women's title and the women's tag team titles with Sasha Banks and Sasha wants to be Sasha two belts too. So she's really on this warpath to sort of becoming you know, on equal footing with Bailey, even if, you know, even if it means taking Asuka's Raw Women's title away. And something that I thought was really cool was the fact that usually, you know, when you when they sign the contracts, they sign them with ink pens. Sasha went back to her NXT days and actually brought out her boss stamp and stamped her signature on there. And I thought that was so cool because in NXT, when she was her boss persona, she would never sign her contract. She would just stamp her name on it. And I thought that was just a really rich girl move. It was really cool. And, um, basically in this aspect going forward with the Drew McIntyre, Dolph Ziggler match, Drew McIntyre is so confident that he can win against Dolph Ziggler that he was able to challenge Dolph Ziggler to create any type of stipulation he wants to in their match. And that could go either really really well or really really bad because of course you know Dolph Ziggler is he's sneaky he likes to create whatever avenue he can to try to win in any way shape or form and it's so weird because he's so good at wrestling period so he doesn't have to really create a stipulation but he just wants to I guess he just wants to anyway just to give him the upper hand so we'll see what happens with that and also in the women's division we had a match between Peyton Royce of the Iconics and Ruby Riot. Now backstage, um, Ruby and Peyton were talking crap at each other and they were basically making it seem like Ruby Riot was just, you know, all alone, even though Ruby had mentioned the fact that they had lost both of their opportunities at the women's tag team titles. But they said, well, at least we have each other, Ruby, you're by yourself. And so Riot had challenged Peyton to a match. And this match was short, but it was still good in the sense that we got to see um, a lot of Peyton Royce's athleticism. And she had pulled this this spinning DDT on Ruby Riot that was amazing. It was almost like she's it was almost like she used Ruby's neck to sort of turn her around and slam her in a way that her, that Ruby's body looked almost like a ribbon twisting in the wind and it was really cool to look at now the only thing that I hate was just the fact that it was really short and there could have been so much more they could have done with that but um that was really cool now Ruby Riot is very talented and I can't wait to see what more they do with her now that she's actually returned and I would prefer if honestly the Iconics would just get back in a tag title picture because I just feel like they're like the purest women's tag team that they have. And I was really rooting for them to win this, you know, time. But of course, they went with Sasha and Bailey, which I'm not mad at. But, you know, I just like, you know, to see pure tag teams win titles. So that was good. And also amongst the women um, in the main event, you had... Drew McIntyre and Asuka tag teaming together against Sasha Banks and Dolph Ziggler. And this match was pretty good because you got you got to see all of them sort of, you know, collectively fight against each other to sort of build up their matches at Extreme Rules. And what's so funny is um, Banks and Banks and Dolph Ziggler won the match. So now they have the momentum at this point going forward. And I'm not necessarily I really don't have anything that drastic to say about the match I just thought it was really good and it was a very interesting dynamic to sort of see you know both of these all these champions with the exception of Dolph Ziggler you know fighting together to sort of beef up the pay-per-view so that was good now something that did happen on Raw that irritated me a whole lot was Big Show calling out Randy Orton and I'm just tired of the big show because it just seems like I find that I, f I find myself getting a little bit irritated with people 
with some part-time wrestlers who just come back just for the sake of doing so because it seems like the big show is only on here to sort of you know be this on-screen presence of of course to be a challenge to randy orton who's picked up his legend killer persona again to a certain degree and also to sort of beef up the fact that he has a show on netflix and it's just kind of like why are you here like it was just it's just lame to me and then what's so funny is they've also gotten Angel Garza and Andrade and Zelina caught up in it because they wanted to challenge the big show to basically, you know, prove, oh, we're a dominant tag team and all this other stuff. And my thing is, if they're going to be a dominant tag team, you know, try to beef them up to go up against the Street Profits. So for them to lose against the big show really just hurt them. These are like these are like newest stars that you are trying to build. And you basically had them lose to the big show for or what exactly why just why it was just it was just weird and then they had just beat the viking raiders you know that same night too so it's just kind of like what's the point like what's the point of having them win against an actual tag team and then get beat up by somebody like the big show who's not even in need of any momentum in his wrestling career at this point like it was just kind of like bleh like and then they and then it's like Andrade and Angel still have you know seeds of discord you know in their unit and it's just so hard because Zelina is trying to keep them together but it's just like I feel like eventually they're gonna break up and Zelina is either gonna have to choose Angel or Andrade or she's gonna or in a beautiful you know woman move she could choose herself I don't know we'll see (laughs) so collectively i just didn't like that um and then we had apollo cruz versus mvp and then bobby lashley versus ricochet and i thought that was interesting because ricochet hasn't really been on television or at least on raw for like a long time like he of course has been wrestling on main event which they have on the wwe network but to see him on television again was a bit refreshing but it was still kind of saddening because he lost to bobby lashley and it was just like man I just feel like Ricochet and Cedric Alexander, you know, to see them backstage was really cool. But I just feel like for them to be as talented as they are in the ring, they just need a character to sort of make them stand out. Because I feel like you can have a lot of athleticism on your shows and stuff like that. But unless you have a character to sort of make you stand out on television in terms of main people who only watch the main roster shows it's like you're kind of almost stuck in like i don't want to say dead in the water but you're almost dead in the water um there's no other way of putting that and i feel like with ricochet and cedric you know they could flourish on shows like 205 live or flourish on shows like nxt because there you can be athletic and it can be enough because they sort of focus on pure wrestling more so like they sort of have a 50 50 between pure wrestling and then having a good character whereas on television with raw and smackdown it's like if you don't have anything that sets you apart nobody's gonna really remember you all that much outside of you know you flipping and doing all kinds of cool cruiserweight stuff so um apollo cruz and his feud with montel vontavious porter mvp is really interesting to sort of watch because it's like mvp is just going back and forth between a manager um for bobby lashley and a wrestler on his own and it's just really cool to see so and also we had Seth Rollins and his constant back and forth (laughs) with Rey Mysterio and his son Dominic and Rey and Dominic weren't on the show they were actually doing it via satellite and they were basically talking about all the vengeance and they're gonna rain upon Seth's head for being you know as ratchet as he's been lately and you had Umberto Carrillo and Aleister Black sort of coming to their defense and fighting you know on behalf of them who couldn't be there and Rollins and Murphy wound up winning the match but something that I'm getting a little bit disappointed with and I feel like I almost say this all the time is the fact that Aleister Black really isn't doing that much outside on his own but just fighting with Umberto Carrillo you know to defend Rey Mysterio's honor 
and it's it for some reason i know that alistair black could technically be a face but at the same time it's just like who he is in terms of his dark persona just wouldn't necessarily stay in this fight this long before he'd move on to something else and it's sort of frustrating for me to see how talented he is and to see how much how great his character really can be and he's just in this fight that really doesn't necessarily mean that much to him in the long run because the fight is really between Seth and Ray and he's just a part of the machine because he because of course Ray needs some backup in terms of Seth and his you know crew of cronies in um Buddy Murphy and Austin Theory and that's cool and everything but I want Alistair Black to do his own thing and I just want Bertha Carrillo to find his own groove so that's basically what happened on Raw and now we're gonna go to NXT Okay, so now we're going to talk about NXT. So this past week and this coming week, they're going to theme their episodes from the Great American Bash, um, which that you may or may not know was a WCW pay-per-view. And they've basically used it to sort of be like a, you know, a counter programming competition with um, AEW's Fighter Fest episodes that are going on. So... They're going to have two nights, spe- like basically a two night special where they have different stuff going on that would be on the same caliber as a pay-per-view. So night one of the Great American Bash started with the Fatal 4-Way elimination match between Mia Yim, Tegan Knox, Candice LeRae, and Dakota Kai to become the number one contender for the NXT women's title that Io Shirai currently holds. Now... This match was really good. Um, it was kind of funny to see Candice LeRae, you know, get eliminated incredibly quickly after Mia Yim hit her with the protect your neck um, finisher. That was really funny. So, you know, Candice LeRae was the first one to be eliminated. And then Mia Yim was the second one to get eliminated in a very surprising way because she basically ruled the entire half of that match after LeRae got eliminated. Like she was kicking all kinds of butt. It was cool. She was hitting um, Tegan Knox and hitting Dakota Kai with the soul food kick that she likes to do. But then somehow or another, Dakota Kai hit this... Um, it was almost like she was going into a backflip, but she really wasn't. She hit like this over, like almost like this cover on me and him to get her eliminated. But me and him's shoulder was up. So I think there was just some type of miscommunication there. But me and him got eliminated and I was bummed out about that. So the two people who were left were Tegan Knox and Dakota Kai, who've been going back and forth ever since last year when Dakota Kai basically stabbed um, Tegan in the back by by basically injuring her knee in the war games match so Raquel Gonzalez was banned from ringside so basically Dakota Kai had to go all by herself in this match and try and win you know of her own merit but Tegan Knox got the best of her by hitting the shiniest wizard onto her after the Molly go round and it was which was a, a move that pays homage to Molly Holly um for those fans of the Attitude Era and she won so now Tegan Knox, the sweetie pie Captain Marvel of WWE is the number one contender for Io Shirai's NXT Women's Championship I'm so proud of her that was so cool to watch also in the women, um, you had Rhea Ripley versus Aaliyah and Robert Stone in a handicap match. And if Robert Stone and Aaliyah had won their handicap match, Rhea Ripley would have had to join the Robert Stone brand. But as you know, Rhea Ripley is totally not a brand person. So Robert Stone came... I was laughing so hard because Robert Stone came down there in his giant boxer's robe because he really thought he was going to do something with, you know, Rhea Ripley or whatever. And, you know, as they were fighting and all of that stuff, it was almost like it was like he was posing more of a distraction for Aaliyah to hit like the real 
you know, wrestling moves or whatever. Because, of course, he wasn't really striking her. But Rhea was basically striking him all and all of the above. And then Aaliyah had, you know, was locked in a cross face at first. But then Robert Stone, you know, then had Rhea Ripley in a Boston Crab. But then, of course, you know, Rhea Ripley refused to give up. And she wound up getting them both locked in the prism trap where they're hanging sort of upside down and she has them in a lock in her arms and they both tapped out so Rhea Ripley won so this match really didn't have that you know any big um stipulations to it and it was just more of a comedy type thing but I was just glad Rhea Ripley came out on top because she's just not a brand person so that really wouldn't have worked as well and with the women you had Io Shirai and Sasha Banks main event in a non-title match and this match was a banger because I feel like I heard someone say I forgot who said it but I heard someone say that the common denominator um between every you know in every match that Sasha Banks has with someone is Sasha Banks and I've said multiple times on here how I feel like Sasha Banks is one of the greatest female wrestlers of our time and she definitely showed it here um in this match she came out all boss persona and everything in NXT she came out with a car um <laughs> she came out in a car like she used to when like which was a callback to NXT takeover in Brooklyn when she came out in an Escalade and she had security sort of escort her to the ring and all of that but she didn't have security escort her to the ring this time she had Bailey and then she came out with her dog Ryu who was like the cutest little puppy and stuff and so she was just out there you know being her boss self and her and Io Shirai just put on a barn burner of a match and it was just really incredible there was always there was also this incredible spot where Sasha Banks slammed Io Shirai into the plexiglass which I thought was vintage heel Banks like oh it was so good this was like this gave me vibes of when Sasha Banks was had Bailey locked um into the bank statement but then it's just like when Bailey was trying to reach with her injured hand she started kicking it it was just like really vicious and it was just really cool so ultimately Sasha Banks wound up losing because as Bailey was trying to distract Io Shirai to give Sasha Banks the advantage Asuka popped up on there and spit green mist in Sasha Banks' face. And so Io Shirai wound up taking advantage of that and winning the match and coming out as the victor. And it was really cool seeing, you know, Io Shirai and Asuka celebrate with each other um, as two powerful Japanese female wrestlers, you know, and they're both champions now. That was really cool. And it was also good to tie in the story that's going on on Raw with Sasha Banks and Asuka together into it. So that was really cool. So all in all with the women, you know, the women just had an amazing night with um, the Great American Bash. And with the men, you sort of you basically had this grappler and British strong style match between Timothy Thatcher and Oni Lorcan. That was a very physical match uh, matchup. And it was kind of random because there really wasn't any build up with it because Timothy Thatcher has basically been doing these um vignettes where he's sort of doing this wrestling school type of thing but that match was still pretty good if you're into pure wrestling like that so it was really cool and then there was a strap match between Roger Strong and Dexter Loomis and that match was very physical but I just felt like Roger Strong was just you know consistently getting creeped out you know by Dexter Loomis and that match was pretty good so and then, of course, you know, you had to have Bobby Fish come out there with Roger Strong to sort of give him a little bit of an upper hand. But that didn't work because Undisputed Era loves to cheat. So, yeah. And Breezango wound up saving Drew McIntyre, not Drew McIntyre, Drew Drake Maverick DM. Oh, my gosh. Drake Maverick from Santos Escobar. And I believe next week they're going to be fighting in a six man tag. Um, and that's going to be really cool because Santo, Santos and his two guys, um, Raul Mendoza and Joaquin Wild, you know, we haven't really seen them, you know, operate as a tag team before. So that's going to be really interesting to see. So that's pretty much all that would happen on NXT's Great American Bash Night 1. And I'm looking forward to Night 2. 
Um, because with night two, you have Keith Lee versus Adam Cole in a winner take all match for the NXT championship and the NXT North American championship. And we got other stuff coming up too on that night. So that's going to be interesting. And now we're going to go to SmackDown. Okay, so for the last um, segment of this week in wrestling, we're going to discuss what happened on SmackDown. Now, amongst the women, you had um, a segment with Bayley and Sasha Banks basically talking about how they've been successful across all three brands or whatever. And Bayley was literally talking about how The Undertaker supposedly called them and praised them for their efforts as of late. And she went as far as to saying that he said that they should have that WWE should make a tribute video to them. And they threw the video on and it was basically Bailey and Sasha talking about how amazing they both are, you know, to each other and showing all of their successes, you know, separately and as a tag team as well. And they were just, you know, of course, you know, just you're my best friend. You're so awesome. Blah, blah, blah. But then Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross interrupted it. Um, and Nikki ba- and Nikki Cross basically claimed that if she puts her heart to it, you know, she knows that she can beat Bailey for the SmackDown Women's Championship at Extreme Rules. Um, but then Cross slapped Bailey, and then Banks basically, Sasha Banks did the one thing that Bailey has been doing to her for weeks, and she accepted a challenge for a match. Um, for Bailey to fight Alexa Bliss. Now, mind you, Bailey wasn't necessarily dressed in any gear to fight, which is so funny because Bailey has been doing that same thing to Sasha Banks for like weeks at a time. She'll, she'll, you know, won't be dressed, you know, for a match, but then she'll, you know, accept a challenge on her behalf and be like, oh yeah, she'll fight in that match. And it was just finally good to see um, Banks do that to Bailey. Which led to a match between Alexa Bliss and Bailey, and that match was pretty good. But it was just, you know, full of interferences from Sasha and from Nikki, and Nikki kind of got carried away to the point to where she um, smacked Bailey in the face. I think, you know, she punched her, and then the referee saw it, so Alexa Bliss got disqualified. So Bailey won the match with um, via disqualification, and. It's pretty good, you know, to see Nikki Cross sort of stand on her own in terms of being a singles contender for a title because she hasn't really done that since NXT. So I'm excited for her in that aspect. I'm not sure if she'll win, but, you know, it's it's still good to see that. And it's nice for a change to see Alexa Bliss sort of be a support system for somebody because for a while it was kind of like before her and Nikki Cross got together as a tag team, Alexa Bliss was always this all about me type person so it's just nice for a change to see that take place and that's pretty much all that happened with the women on smackdown now with the men um matt riddle started the show with michael cole and they were basically having this promo where they were talking to each other and basically Corey graves you know showed a recap of his debut with him beating aj styles in a non-title match and matt riddle basically says and Matt Riddle was basically talking about, you know, what his origins are and where he came from and why he wrestles bare feet, which led to him telling the story of how when he was a kid, um, he went back and forth between swimming in a pool and playing out in the snow and he wound up getting frostbite and his feet almost, you know, got amputated, but they recovered. And so now he really doesn't feel anything when he, you know, walks out barefoot. So he just, so he just does that. And, um, then Baron Corbin came out there and talked about how much of a loser he thinks Matt Riddle is. And when Matt Riddle was kind of bucking to fight, um, King Corbin, King Corbin was like, no, you're not going to fight me. You're going to fight John Morrison instead. So this match between Matt Riddle and John Morrison was absolutely brilliant. Like you could tell that they have sort of similar, but almost like similar styles of wrestling in terms of also like the grappling and also with the high flying as well even though matt riddle isn't that much of a high flyer 
it was just like a really good match like it was just a lot of back and forth there was this one spot that i really loved where morrison fought out and delivered a middle rope spanish fly and then another standing spanish fly onto matt riddle it was really cool um but matt riddle wound up beating john morrison and they have amazing chemistry and i wouldn't mind seeing them in a back and forth feud at all and then we had and then there was a brawl that ensued after the match happened and with that brawl aj styles basically came out and fought matt riddle as he was celebrating his win but then drew gulak came out there and fought on his behalf which led to the intercontinental championship match between drew and aj and this match was pretty good too but of course you know aj styles won and something that i find very interesting is the fact that aj styles is sort of saying he's not giving any handouts you know for the intercontinental championship but i really feel like if he were able to give other wrestlers who we wouldn't normally see in the intercontinental title picture a chance to go after the title and that would be really cool like i would be interested in seeing like one of the usos um the one uso who isn't injured i would be interested in seeing him in that and i would also be interested in seeing big e in that since they want to do you know tag team titles you know and do the whole double title thing with bailey and sasha do that same thing again with the new day like why not you know just try something else and also amongst the men speaking of the new day we had a match between kofi kingston and shinsuke nakamura because as of late, Nakamura and Cesaro have been sort of targeting the New Day, you know, and saying nobody gives them enough attention and, you know, and basically wanting to go after the SmackDown tag team titles. And this match was pretty good, except for Cesaro sort of getting involved. And with him getting involved, Big E would get angry that he would get involved. And the referee, Jessica, actually sent Big E out first but then also sent Cesaro out so e so they basically even up the odds between the two and Nakamura was controlling you know coming out of a commercial break but then Kingston was f fighting out from underneath and elbowing out of a sleeper hold and delivering a drop kick to Shinsuke and then Kingston hit the trouble in paradise but then Nakamura answered with a kick of his own for a near fall and then Kingston hit a SOS and it wound up going and it wound up going for a count of two. But then Nakamura recovered and delivered the Kinshasa for the victory. And this basically gave Nakamura and Cesaro a whole lot of momentum going forward. So I'm I'm assuming that at some point um they're going to challenge for those SmackDown tag team titles. I'm not sure if it's going to be at Extreme Rules or not, but I think it's going to be really interesting. I think they may have announced that they're going to be fighting for the tag team titles at SmackDown next week. So, hey, whatever. And then um, SmackDown ended with Sheamus and his toast to Jeff Hardy because they're still going with this Jeff was an alcoholic type, you know, storyline. And Seamus wasn't there actually to give the toes. He was actually in a room somewhere with an Irish flag. And it looked like it could have been his own apartment or his own house. But, you know, who knows? And he was just talking crap at him, you know, by bringing up his past addictions and all this other stuff. And Matt Hardy was just like, what's the point of this? And just when um, Seamus thought that Jeff was actually going to go back to his old ways of drinking, Jeff broke the champagne glass over the personal bartender's head and delivered a swanton bomb to close out the show now i can say something that irritates me about this feud between sheamus and jeff hardy is the fact that sheamus has already beaten jeff hardy he beat him at backlash we okay we get it you were you think you're better than him now if they're gonna do this to lead to a rematch i would have preferred for them to just do like a promo to say oh i want a rematch because i know i can beat you you know with jeff and sheamus but instead we get more of sheamus making fun of the fact that jeff was you know an alcoholic and i'm just like okay we get it like it's been highly publicized almost every time jeff hardy has gotten into some type of trouble it's been on the news like over and over again and jeff is doing his his very best to not you know fall back into those old destructive habits and 
if we know that and if we know that Jeff is working on himself, why do they consistently try to make it a storyline on television? Just stop it. Like, do something else, please, because this is getting old. But that's basically all that what happened on SmackDown. And that's basically all that happened this week on wrestling. So now we're just going to go towards the conclusion. All right. So thank you for listening to this new episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. Um, I want to send a special thank you to Jared Hicks for coming on my show and for basically beefing up his Blurred Over podcast and his Blurred Over brand with Michael Blair, um, who is another awesome person. And I also want to thank everyone who's been listening from the beginning and thank anyone who started listening, you know, with this episode or any other episode at this point. And I hope that you continue to find a safe space to listen to what's going on in wrestling here with this podcast um so if you want to follow me on social media you can follow me at hardy wrestle pod on twitter you can also follow me um on instagram at hardy wrestling podcast and you can follow me on instagram um at queen steph hardy and you can do the same thing for twitter as well at queen steph hardy now you can also follow my facebook page where i post all kinds of cute wrestling um memes and all kinds of stuff like that and sneak peeks of different episodes um on my facebook page that's the hardy wrestling with stephanie hardy page and you can also listen to the podcast on youtube i have a youtube channel called hardy wrestling with stephanie hardy and you can listen to me anywhere you get your podcast as apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, here on the anchor app um you can also listen on iHeartRadio and spotify and various other places as well so thank you so much for sticking with me i hope you're staying safe um with this crisis going on and i hope that you're fighting for justice wherever you are where you see fit and i just hope you're living your best life and until we meet again this is hardy wrestling with me your girl stephanie hardy bye y'all